So we've just finished. Um, we've just finished 40 days. Many of us, you see all these red shirts that people are wearing. A lot of other people in small groups and on their own, individuals, couples, have been using uh, the book that we've been that's titled the Red Letter Challenge. So we've been in the words of Jesus, and He's invited us to put those words into practice. And you can see them rela- reflected up here on these banners that we have on the wall: being and forgiving, serving, giving, and going. It's interesting, in the last year, for whatever reason, um, and sometimes I'm a night owl and sometimes it's a way for me to decompress from all the stuff that you do as a pastor, I'll binge watch TV. And so I binge watched the Monk series TV show. I, I watched that. So if I'm a little quirky, you know why. Um, I binge watched this Canadian comedy called Corner Gas. If anyone has ever heard of that, it's awesome. I love it. It's hilarious. Um, and then I binge watched Battlestar Galactica. Anyway, it's really um, that's another one. I don't recommend it, but anyway, it's uh, interesting if you're a Trek, if you're kind of a science fiction geek. And then now I've been binge watching the um, the uh, kind of the Marvel movies in order here. I had to ask my son. I go, which one's next? Right, so there's a lot of them. So I'm watching. So I started with Captain America, and I've been working my way along, and I'm about to Infinity War now, and so I'm just kind of trying to keep the story all in line and watching that. But one of the one I really want to tell you is, and Jim and his family does this every Christmas. We don't every Christmas, but about every couple of years, I'll put in the Lord of the Rings, and so off we go, and then it's just about four weeks of what? <laughs> no, it's about a day, a full day of watching uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, it was funny when those movies first came out because um, I started reading it when I was about 14, 13 or 14 years old, The Hobbit and then The Lord of the Rings. I just fell in love with them and the Narnia stuff and all of those things. And many of you know that about me and about Jim. And we just treasure those biblical images and those images that come through those stories. But I remember when the movies, back when I first read them as a, as a teenager, they tried to make movies about them and they were singularly horrible. They just were horrible because they never began to match what was in your mind, what you imagined as you read them. Because you paint pictures in your mind and you, you, you build movie sets or whatever in your mind. You, you, and it, those movies didn't. And then they came out with this thing called CGI. And as it improved and got better and better, it was amazing. I remember sitting in the first of the Lord of the Rings movies, watching them go through the mines of Moria, and I said, this is better than I pictured in my own mind. And, um, and, then, and, and it was funny, because they came out over a series of years. Why they didn't each of them win the Academy Award for Best Picture, I will never know. Anyway, no. But I remember when I finished it, I had a letdown. When I sat through that last movie and saw the great victory that they accomplished, you know, in the, in the books, in this epic story, I really had a letdown. Have any, I'm not asking you about that, Lord of the Rings, but you know that feeling, don't you? You finish something? Like even with these dumb TV shows I'm watching, I got to the end of Monk and I'm like, there's no more, you know, <laughs> or whatever. It's kind of this letdown. And it's funny, you know, because that can happen in lots of ways. Uh, Here we do a process called confirmation with young people. It can feel like a letdown almost when that's done. Okay, did that. Check. Or, you know, we got a high school now. We're going to graduate our first seniors. And uh, it could be, uh, okay, I'm done. You know, it's kind of a letdown almost. Now what? Now what? is almost kind of the question, now what happens? And, and that can happen in so many different areas of my life. Sadly, every once in a while I see it with people, in, even in marriage. Ooh, we had an awesome wedding. Now what? You know, um, or people will become members of the church, go through class and it's exciting and we're all in, and then now what? Because I think when you go through these 40 days of an experience like this, it's easy to kind of say that. Now what? Uh, it was cool. We did it together. I was in a part of a group. We encouraged one another. It was cool to hear the stories, and we were together. But now what happens? So I'm going to tell you a story about my dear father-in-law, Teresa's dad, who I miss terribly. Went to be with the Lord a number of years ago now. I grew up in New York City. He taught me how to fish, taught me how to change oil in a car, taught me how to 
do breaks and frame a wall and use a tape measure. That sounds dumb, doesn't it? But actually, you got to learn how to use a tape measure, all those kinds of things. And I miss him. I remember the first time I, I came out to Cataldo, Idaho, is where they lived, up northern Idaho. And I went with Teresa, who was my girlfriend at the time, and she, she invited me to meet her family. We went up there, and, and he said, let's go fishing. So we went, got in the boat, and went out fishing. And we went to a little small lake, you know, that had crappie in it, crappie and bass and stuff like that. And he said, man, they're really hitting over the last few weeks. And he taught me what to use and how to do it. I hadn't done that. And we caught 45 fish. 45 fish we kept. 45 fish. So we get home and it's dark. So it's about 9, you know, 9.30. It's dark. And he says to me, so this is my first time with my father-in-law. Okay, just remember, who would, to be, who would become my father-in-law? And he goes, you ever filleted a fish? I said, well, no, I've never filleted a fish. He said, let me show you. So he takes out his fillet knife and hands me the knife. I think I got it. I didn't want to look stupid, so I proceeded. And then he goes inside the house. <laughs> I have 44 fish. Three hours later, seriously, three hours later, I finally finish. Those first few fish, it was just, they were just mutilated. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, by the time I was done, I know how to fillet a fish. I can fillet any fish you give me. Seriously, and I love to do it, and I've used that skill over and over and over in many settings, often to sometimes help other people. But little did I know, he was sitting in the mud room. He went, he went in the, he got a, brought a kitchen stool out, sat on the stool, popped open a beer, and stood there and watched me laugh the whole time. <laughs> he wondered when I was going to ask him for some help. He wondered, and I never did. But I tell you what, I learned how to do it. I learned how to do it. Uh, this is kind of my point, because he did other things with me. He, he taught me how to tune up a car. Remember when you had to do those things? Like a timing belt and gap spark plugs and do all of those kinds of things that you almost don't ever do anymore. Um, changing out winter tires and changing brakes. That's the guy who taught me all those things. And you know, it would have been one thing for me if I had simply done those things to satisfy my father-in-law and check off a box. Get what I'm saying? Okay, I did that thing. I didn't look like a fool. I'm still okay. I'm good enough for his daughter. I will never fillet another fish. I will never change the oil again. I will never fix. But it's not how it worked with my father-in-law. We did it over and over and over, and I do it to this day. And I have used those skills and those experiences I've had, I hope and pray, to bless my family and to bless others. And that's the point. You can go through 40 days with Jesus and read your lessons, do those things, and check the box and say, I think maybe I did enough to make my father happy. I checked off a box. And if we do that, then it will have been a waste of, we will have wasted our time. Uh, we will have not done those things which Christ has actually called us to do because he's calling us into relationship. So I'm going to walk through these things with you, these five things, real quickly, because you know something that struck me this week? There's a lot of 40s in the Bible. Right? If you're a student of the Bible at all, you know there's a bunch of 40s. And you heard three of them in readings here today. Uh, one of them was um, with Elijah. And that's the first one I want to look at that because Jesus' disciples essentially at the end of Jesus' ministry say that, say that to him. Okay, Jesus, now what? And Jesus uses these words because they don't really quite get it. Even then, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection is what we call ascension. Ten days later is then what we call Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes. That's the birthday of the church. But for 40 days, Jesus stayed and taught his disciples. That's what Luke tells us in Acts. 40 days he taught his disciples. And so Jesus, the disciples essentially come to Jesus. He's about to ascend to heaven, and he, they say to him, now what? They say it this way. Okay, Jesus, is now when we're going to have the kingdom of Israel? Right? And are we going to have implied, are we going to be important in it? You know? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know that. 
I'm going to tell you what comes next. Here's what comes next. You'll be my witnesses. Here, here in town, in Jerusalem, and then in the state, in Judea, and then you're going to go to some people you don't like very well, the, Samari the Samaritans, and then you're going to go to people you like even less. Those are those crazy Gentiles out there. And so he says, that's what's next. And so if that's the case, how do these 40s maybe help us to know what comes next? Now what? The first one is with Elijah. Elijah, it says, he just came off a mountaintop experience. Mount Carmel, forgive me, that's a bad pun. He came off a, a victory, a Super Bowl victory. And so all by himself, God helped give him a victory over 700 prophets of the false god Baal. 700. And God in fire and majesty, boom, does this and shows that he is the true God. But then Elijah's on the run because the queen did not like it that he um, showed up and showed up the prophets of Baal. And so off he goes. There's a famine in the land. He, has, he, gets stuck, he gets stuck in a place and then he's under a tree. He's like giving up. And God sent ministers to him and says, here's a meal. This is going to sustain you for 40 days. And for 40 days... Elijah then heads to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, right? Mount Sinai. So 40 days. 40 is an interesting number in the Bible because there's lots of numbers in the Bible. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Like, for instance, uh, a 1,000, a millennium. If that's a literal 1,000 years that God chooses to do, that's awesome. That's great. But really, it's very suspicious because it's such a round number, isn't it? For a thousand years, because a thousand is ten times ten times ten, or ten cubed, right? Well, ten in the Bible is a perfect amount of time for God. It's a complete period of time. Those are God times, ten. It's interesting, when it's cubed, it means it's the perfect, triune, godly reign. That's the idea. Okay, so... It can be more or less or exactly 10,000 years, but that's the idea behind it. Or here's another one. In the Revelation, it tells you 144,000 saved people, right? Well, there better be more than that or we're out of luck, okay? But 144,000 is interesting because it's 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. You get it? 12 Old Testament tribes, 12 New Testament apostles times 10 times 10 times 10. So it means all believers for all time. Isn't that assuring? I hope that gives you comfort. But 40 is interesting because 4 is a number that means humanity or the earth or even things that are imperfect. 4. So it relates to us times 10, a perfect amount of time for God. So 40s are almost always God doing something with fallen humanity, testing them, trying them, cleansing them. So for Elijah, for 40 days, God is doing a work on him. Because Elijah sits there on the mountain and he starts belly aching. Oh, because God comes to me and says, so what's up, Elijah? And Elijah goes, oh, this just stinks. I'm on the run and the queen's after me and all these people, they don't love you and I'm the only one that loves you. Right? God kind of goes, no, that's not true. I got a whole bunch. I got 7,000. That's another symbolic number. Seven times 10 times 10. All right. I got 7,000 who continue to worship me. He says, hang in there. Now I'm going to reveal myself to you, Elijah, and step outside. So he steps outside on the mountain, and what comes? Huge wind, big earthquake, lightning, th you know, thunder, flashing. And it says God was not in any of those things. What was God in? In the still, small voice, or in, your, in other translations, in a gentle whisper. You know why I love that so much? Point number one. Now what? It's critical that we continue to be with God. That we continue to simply recognize who He has made you to be. He has called you His own. He has redeemed you. You are a child of God. And that we simply be with God. And I love this passage because it says He found God in a gentle whisper. Because you know what? Aren't your lives noisy? I don't know. My life is kind of noisy. It, I, yeah, I hope you understand what I mean. The phone rings, emails come in, texts come in. There's a con my phone blinks and blings and rings and dings and all day long. And if I sit down in my office, it's a constant series of interruptions. They're all blessed interruptions, most of them. But it's a constant noise. And there are times when I need God to speak. You know why God speaks to you in a still, small voice? 
Because to hear him, you've got to shut up. Right? To hear him, you need to be quiet. And so every once in a while, I'm going to do this with you right now. It's funny with the sound system we have, so don't touch the sound system. I have some members every once in a while that will say to me, sometimes you speak too softly. And every once, and I'll tell them, every, I said, but you know what? When I spoke more softly, you listened more carefully. And so that's what I think God's doing. I think God does that. So the first thing is when we say, now what, Lord? We've been through 40 days, or we've been at Triumph, or it's been a great experience. Now what? The first thing is to be with God, to remember who we are, who he's made us to be. The second thing is this, is forgiving. There's another 40 days, and that's with Noah. And maybe you know that one, 40 days of rain, 40 days and nights of rain. Let me tell you what that story is about. Folks, parents, let me tell you this. Uh, the Noah story is not a kid's story. I mean, you do what you want. You do what you want. Play school, toys, and all of that. It is a horrible story in which God, it says, even repented having made mankind. He was sorry he had made mankind because they were in complete rebellion to him. They were defiant to him. They were thumbing their nose at him all the time. And thankfully, we're not in the days of Noah. We still have the freedom and the joy to do this very thing we're doing today, don't we? And in the days of Noah, essentially, it says no one was doing this. No one was worshiping God. No one was honoring him or seeking his ways. They were all in rebellion and defiant to him, and, except for Noah. And so you know what the story of Noah is really about? It's about cleansing. And cleansing is about forgiving because that's what happens in forgiveness. Acknowledging our brokenness, God has the chance to cleanse us, to forgive us. That's one of the great gifts that we talk about in baptism. It's why we use water in baptism because it washes, it washes. And God washes us clean. We, pray, we praise Him for that. It's not always easy, though, is it? That forgiving thing. I had someone come out after the first service and say, man, I, she, she was very kind and grateful for what she said, but man, I got, I got stuff that God needs to do in me still. And I'm telling you this, I got one in my own life that I'm wrestling over in my own family. <laughs> that I'm, because here's the thing that, I, that, that strikes me about forgiveness. Um, and I've never said it this way. I'm going to say it to you here. It just struck me this week, and I wrote it down. The next step of any relationship waits for forgiveness. Did you catch? Did you hear that? I think that's significant. The next step of any relationship is waiting on forgiveness. If there's forgiveness that needs to be had, and I need to do some apologizing, and I need to be seeking some grace, um, and I know that my relationship in that, in that particular scenario is waiting for that. It is not going to go more. And you know why we confess our sins every week? I always chuckle because a lot of you don't regularly worship here, which is awesome. You honor us by being here today. Thank you. Thank you. But you know, Lutherans are weird. We confess our sins every week. It's weird, isn't it? Um, it's just being honest, to be frank. But let me tell you why I find that so important. It's what comes next. Because Jesus is waiting every week. He says, my relationship with you is waiting on forgiveness. Because every time you experience my grace, we move ahead. Every time you experience my grace, we take a step forward. That's the cool thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness is all about relationships. Because with forgiveness, we grow in them. That's what Jesus is after, not just for him, but so that we can experience it with one another as well. That's what the flood is about, to cleanse, to clean, so that we can take the next step forward. God needed to forgive so that we could move forward in our relationship. The next 40 is from Israel's past. Israel had 40 years in the wilderness, didn't they? Not 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness before they were able to enter the promised land. And you know what's funny? So I'm watching Captain America, and that, that, now that movie's kind of dated. It's been out there a while. I'm watching the Captain America movie, and you know how the story goes? He's a little scrawny guy. He's like a 90-pound weakling, we used to call him. I don't know. Is that politically incorrect for me to say that? Did I say Is that bad? I don't know. He's, he's a little wimpy guy. Is that wrong, too? I think you know what I mean. Anyway, and then he gets the super serum, right? The super soldier serum, and ba-boom, all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a hunk, you know, and he's this, Captain America, right? But while he's still little, 
while he's little, he's in basic training, and the professor wants to kind of check him out, and several times in the movie, Steve Rogers, Captain America, says, is this a test? And it's a really cute line. It's a clever line because the answer, it's almost humorous. Of course it's a test. Of course it's a test. And in that particular case, they were not testing his physique. They were testing his heart. And that's what made Captain America. It was not his physique as much as his heart. I mean, that's kind of the theme of the movie. And you know what's funny is Israel was tested, and I think this third one is this one, serving. God was calling them to serve, and they failed. To serve God, to serve one another, to serve those around them. Over and over and over, God was inviting them to service, to care for one another, because God had served them. God had modeled this for them. They were slaves. He got them out. They were standing at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army on them. God brought them through. They were in the wilderness starving. God brought them manna. They were sitting there dying of thirst. God served them. God served them again and again and again in spite of their complaining, and they never learned the lesson. And my point for us is, now what? Let's serve. Don't fail to learn the lesson of which God gave us as he gave the, the, the lessons of the Israelites. One of the great blessings I loved of this Red Letter Challenge, and by the way, if some of you are going, I wonder what that is, and I'm, uh, I'm curious about it, you can pick up a book. We can get you a book. You can go through it anytime. It doesn't have to start at a certain day or end. We just did it that way because we think it helped. But you're welcome to it. But this third one here is the idea is, uh, what I loved about the, the Red Letter Challenge was it, every day it forced me to think about it. I don't know, is, is this a bad admission as a pastor? I don't think about my relationship with Christ every day. But in the Red Letter Challenge, I did. I started my day that way. It set the tone of my day. So for that reason, that was God calling me for 40 days. I want you to be in service to me. Don't forget the lessons. Don't forget the lessons. Fourth thing is this. The fourth thing is this. So as a teacher, I was a teacher for seven years, and I would ask my kids, and I still teach, confirmation, life of Christ, I still do things. When I give tests, I would tell kids, I am not going to give you anything on this test that, does, that isn't important. I was uninterested in trivia. If I tell you this, I'm telling it to you because it matters. Now, let me tell you why, you, if you'll pay attention, I'll tell you why this matters. I'll give you an example. Why does it matter that the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C.? That sounds like dumb trivia, doesn't it? If you're 14 years old and I say, I want you to know on a test, when was the temple destroyed in the Old Testament? I want you to say 586 B.C. and I want to know who did it, Babylon. I want you to know that. You know why? You might say, oh, that's just dumb history. Who cares? No, here's why. Because the people of Israel were convinced from that point on that they had screwed up and they needed to be better and better and better people in order to get God to save them. And God had to prove it wrong by sending a Savior who saved them by grace. It wasn't the temple that saved them. It wasn't the law that saved them. They needed to learn something new. Get it? I, that's how I teach. That's how I, how I teach. I give them information that matters. So what's this point with Jesus being tempted by the devil for 40 days? It's one of the funny lines in the Bible too, isn't it? Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. Yeah, right. Of course. Who wouldn't be? I'm hungry after four minutes. So... So Jesus, is, uh, so Jesus is being tempted. Here's the point. The devil loves to distract Jesus and give him excuses and reasons for why he could divert from his mission. And I'm going to say this to you this way, because you know what Jesus' true mission was? It wasn't to do magic tricks and turn stones into bread. It wasn't for him to meet his own physical needs because he was hungry or because he was limited in a human condition. It wasn't so that he could show he was powerful and had authority over kingdoms and so forth, or that he was super religious. Jesus' fundamental purpose was to be generous. Because that's who Jesus is. He gives his life he gives his whole being. He gives us grace. He gives us membership in his family. He cleanses us. Jesus constantly gives. And that's what Jesus is longing for in his people. 
That's the main thing. And the devil is never able to distract him. Even at a lowest physical spot, he can't distract him. Jesus keeps the main thing the main thing, which is his purpose to come was to give you his grace. The whole word grace simply means gift. That's the word in Greek, gift. Jesus fundamentally came to give. And that's why he calls us to be generous because we have received so much. Last thing is this. So I was sick in a weird way. Anybody have this bug over the last few weeks? I, anyway, I got this bug. The school has just been, phew, I mean, it was devastated by it for a little while. Um, so a couple weeks ago, I was at Yellowstone celebrating my birthday. And we were up there three days. And the third day, I just didn't feel right. I was just, uh, we had hike planned. We we're going to go back in the park. And I go, let's just go home. 12 days, 12 days I was in that, I don't want to do anything. You know how, do you, anybody relate to this? I just want to sit at home. I just want to sit at home and read or watch TV. I don't want to answer email. I, don't want, I just want to do anything. And you force yourself to do what you have to do, but you just don't want to do it. Finally, yesterday, I got my mojo back. I mean, yesterday was great. I, I'm going, I'm reading the news. I go up in the morning. Oh, there's two hours until rain. So I pruned all the trees and we fertilized the yard. Of course, I think the Andersons are here. I believe it was 40 mile an hour winds and I fertilized your yard. <laughs> so anyway, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> And then we made the run to the dump, you know, get rid of all the stuff. And then I, my son-in-law calls me, and he had worked 25 hours in a row, and he's helping out this other family. He's, he has a great heart, uh, helping them redo their kitchen. And he said, would you help me? Which I, I'm, I love it when, he, uh, when I get asked to help. We're sheetrocking a wall, a wall and mudding and taping and doing all this stuff. I got my mojo back. I could go for it. I could go for it. So the last one is go and tell. And you know what? You know why I think so many Christians say, I think I'd like to just stay home. I think I'd like to just watch TV. I think I just, and it's because we're not healthy, right? See, when I wasn't healthy for 12 days, I just said, I don't want to. I don't want to. But man, I got my mojo back. So what's it take to get your mojo and I am praying that throughout these five things, this is the last thing I want you to hear, is that we had a Savior who took the longest trip anyone has ever taken from heaven to earth, taking on humanity, full humanity, walking with us, loving us, sacrificing that we might be his own. And he came to tell and speak into our hearts how precious we are to him, how valuable we are. This is why I sit in the front row while these kids stand up here and sing, and I cry. Because there's nothing that touches my heart than a little one telling me about Jesus Christ. Nothing touches me like someone in innocence and ingenuous who tells me of the love of Christ. They had their mojo today, wouldn't you say? And so just as Jesus speaks into our hearts, we have the privilege to be able to share that grace with others. May that be what happens next for you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this day of worship, for our kids who sang and bore witness to you, for the love which you've shown us. Thank you, Lord, for these five principles, to be your child, to experience your grace, to serve in love, to have generous hearts, and then to go and tell. Lord, you did all those things first, and you did them in far superior ways to any of us, and yet we have the joy to reflect your love to others. Bless us, Lord, to follow you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.